Amen. So, this morning I want to preach to you about how to admit you're wrong. How to admit you're wrong. <clears throat> now, this is an important subject because uh, it needs to be preached because a lot of people struggle with this. They struggle with the ability to admit that they're wrong when they are wrong. And, of course, it's easy to admit when we're wrong about little things, when we dial the wrong number, right? We say, sorry about that. Or we take the wrong turn. You know, we're e it's easy for us to admit that we're wrong about little things. But often in life, when big things happen, when we're wrong about something uh, that has more serious consequences, or even minor consequences, uh, be it in the workplace or a church or wherever, whatever the setting might be, it's difficult for us to admit sometimes that we're wrong. And really, that's why I entitled it How to Admit You're Wrong, because uh, we need to understand how to do that. Uh, the fact is that we're going to be wrong at times, all of us. None of us is perfect. And <clears throat> it's important that we understand uh, how to do this because of the fact that our mistakes have consequences. And those consequences don't often don't only affect us, but they also affect those around us, the, the mistakes that we make. That's why it's important that we own up to those mistakes and correct them. So that's what I want to preach to you about this morning, how to admit that you're wrong. And uh, really, of course, one of the biggest uh, motivations to even endeavor uh, to learn how to admit you're wrong would be to understand why uh, you need to admit you're wrong. So we need to understand, first of all, you know, if we're going to understand how to admit we're wrong, we need to understand, first of all, why we should be willing to admit that we're wrong. Now you're there in Genesis chapter 3, look at verse 8 where the Bible reads, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. And the Lord God called Adam uh, unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman that thou gavest to me with me, she gave of me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that thou this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now keep something in Genesis three. We're going to come back to it later in the sermon. But go ahead and turn over to Romans five. Keep something in Genesis three, and then turn over to Romans five. So one of the reasons why we need to admit that we're wrong when we're wrong is because of the fact that we are all going to be wrong. Why do you need to learn this morning uh, how to admit you are wrong? Because of the fact that you are going to be wrong. Every single one of us is going to make mistakes. Every single one of us is going to do the wrong thing. And it's important that we learn how to admit we're wrong because we are all going to be wrong. Because we're all sinners. And we see this is where it starts, isn't it? With Adam and Eve, they have that fallen nature. They do, they disobey, they do the wrong thing. God clearly told them not to eat of that tree, and they went ahead and did it anyway. Right. And because of that, we've inherited that nature. We have that tendency in us to do the wrong thing. This is why we don't have to instruct our children on how to do the wrong thing. It comes to them naturally. They don't need to be told how to lie, how to steal, how to cheat, how to do all these wrong things that are contrary to the Word of God. It's just in us. It's uh, something that we're born with. Look there in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We've inherited that same nature that Adam has. That, that, that nature is one that tends to do the, <coughs> excuse me, the wrong thing. So that's one reason why we should learn how to admit wrong. Because we all have that tendency in those to do the wrong thing. But not only that, because a lot of the times when we do the wrong thing, a lot of other people already know it. We'll do something wrong and others around us will say, well, that guy's doing the wrong thing. That lady's doing the wrong thing. And, and we need to be willing to admit that and, 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 and confess that and, and own up to that. <clears throat> if you go, uh, if you would, over to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Galatians 6, beginning of verse 1, the Bible says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, <clears throat> considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye, also, uh, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. 
And the Bible's showing us right there that really when we think that we're something, when we're nothing, we're not fooling the others around us. Right. The only persons that, that is being deceived is ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we need to be willing to admit that we're wrong because of the fact that everybody else knows when we're wrong. You know, obviously if it's something that's that obvious and that apparent, it only takes somebody to just look at a situation or look at a decision that you've made or where you're at in life and say, oh, this person has done this something wrong here. And again, in any situation you want to put that in, whether it be as an employer uh, to an employee, as a, from one spouse to another, as parents to children, uh, within a church setting, just out in the world in general, people can look at our situation, they can look at the decisions we've made and said, this person has done something wrong here. And often if we don't, and a lot of times we don't want to admit that we're wrong because we want to deceive ourselves and say, no, I've done the right thing here. I know I'm doing the right thing. It can be hard to admit that we're wrong. And we'll get into a little bit more later, of course, as the sermon is entitled, How to Admit We're Wrong, and what it's going to take for us to be able to do that. Uh, <clears throat> you see, not owning up to your wrongdoing, that's a form of, of deception. And a lot of people sometimes when they get called on the carpet for wrongdoing, instead of just saying, yeah, I did the wrong thing, you're right, they start to do uh, a lot of different things. They try to deceive themselves, and then really what they're trying to do is deceive you. But if, you're, if you have you know, half a brain, a lot of times... Uh, you can see it coming and you know that they're just trying to not own up to having done wrong. A lot of times you will go to people or, uh, and, and say, hey, we already know the situation. We already know that uh, you've, you've made this mistake. We already know you're the one to blame. We already know where the fault lies. And you'll go to that person, you'll confront them with it, and, you'll just, and you can just watch people start to just not own up to it. And they'll start to try to deceive you. But here's the thing, the only person they're deceiving is themselves. Because we already know the truth. You know, if you're going to somebody about a situation, and this shows up in different ways. A lot of times it's just non-direct answers. And this is, a, this is the practical part of it. You can actually watch somebody to start to say, hey, did you notice such and such a thing? Did you, uh, did you know this was the case? And you already know they knew about it. Did you know about this? How long have you known about it? Uh, 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 they'll stutter, they'll stammer. They'll kind of slightly acknowledge, yeah, I guess, you know, maybe, I suppose, about, you know, whatever. It's really vague. They get a lot of vague answers. And then they'll just start throwing a lot of details around a situation. They'll start throwing out a lot of, well, this and that, making up a lot of excuses. But the one thing they won't do is say, yeah, that was my fault. Yeah, you're right. I messed up. You know, I've even seen people just completely ignore the person asking, making the inquiry. Saying, hey, something's wrong. Did you know about this? We already know that you know about it. We're just seeing if you own up to it. And saying, hey, did you know about this? Did you, did you notice this? And they'll just put their fingers in their ears. I've seen this. Well, they're just, you know, kids will do this sometimes. Well, maybe if I just pretend I didn't hear them, they'll go away. <laughs> you know, if I'll just sit in the corner, I am not listening to this. <laughs> and they'll just open their eyes and it's all gone away. And that doesn't work. And, and yet, even if, I've seen even adults do this. So <clears throat> we need to understand why we should admit we're wrong and, and not try to deceive people because it's important that until we understand why that we must admit we're wrong, we'll never understand how to admit we're wrong. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, uh, 19, a servant will not be corrected by words, for though he understand, he will not answer. You know, the Bible's showing us there's some people that you can't correct them with words. You can't come to them and say, hey, I know you did this. Is this your, you know, your fault? They'll call you on the carpet. And some people... Though they understand who's at fault, they will not answer. They'll try to uh, deceive you, or they'll just try to give a non-answer, or they'll try to just pretend that this line of uh, uh, in, in, you know, inquisition or inquiry just isn't taking place. And sometimes they'll even go so far as to resort to lying about it. They'll just flat out lie and say, no, it wasn't me. Well, we got CTs, we got footage, we know it's you. Oh, uh, it was, it was a guy in a, a clever plastic suit that looked like me, you know. <laughs> People will go to great ends sometimes in lying and trying to get out, instead of just doing the simple thing, you're just owning up to the truth and admitting it. Right. <clears throat> and we have to be careful about this because, you know, lying takes a lot of different forms. And when we're trying to avoid guilt or dodge guilt, and we start to uh, not admit when we're wrong, what we're really doing is we're lying in one form, shape, uh, or, uh, one form or another. And... We have to be careful because where, who is the father of lies? It's the devil. The Bible says that, uh, you know, the, the, that uh, when he speaketh of a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. You know, lying is a big sin. And it's not something that we want to have anything to do with. 
Right. Now, of course, we all tend to, uh, to do that, you know, out of, out of just trying to save face. That's a lot of time, that's our instinct. But we should be very careful not to uh, tell lies. You know, some people will say, I've heard this, some people will say, you know, honesty is the best policy. Well, really, our motto should be honesty is the only policy. You know, that you, when you say honesty is the best policy, you're saying, well, maybe there's another policy that's not as good as honesty, but it'll do. You know, honesty should be our only policy. And we'll save ourselves a lot of heartache, and we'll save ourselves a lot of humiliation if when we're wrong, we're willing to just admit it and own up to it and, and endure uh, the consequences that come. So why should you admit you're wrong? A lot of times it's because, first of all, you're a sinner just like me. We're all sinners. We're all going to be wrong from time to time. Granted, some of us are going to be more wrong than often, right? Oh. All the wives are like, yep, right? And they're all nodding their head vigorously. So... We're all going to make mistakes. You know, we're all sinners. We're all going to be wrong. Another reason why is because a lot of times when you're getting called on the carpet for something, having done something or, or whatever it is, that person already knows you're the one to blame. That person already knows you're the one that does wrong. So there's no point in not admitting you're wrong. And we don't want to resort to lying. But one of the main reasons why we should be willing to admit that we're wrong is so that we can get it right. Say, hey, you're never, you know, I mean, even, even the world understands this. Right. That the first step to recovery is admitting you have a problem. So, you know, one of the reasons why we should be willing to admit that we're wrong is so that we can get it right and fix it. You know, you can't fix what you refuse to admit is broken. You know, if your car starts to break down and make funny noises, you can't just drive it down the road and wish it away. Right. You know, you got to take the mechanic and pay somebody to fix that thing. Somebody has to diagnose it and say, this is the problem. This is what needs fixed. It's the same way with our lives. If we're going to get things right in our life, we have to admit these things are wrong. What we're doing is wrong, and then we can fix it. <clears throat> and, you know, we should definitely, I mean, if we were, let's continue with that analogy of the car. If we were to take our car to the mechanic and pull it in and say, hey, I noticed something a little funny about my car. And he said, well, you know, you, you got to replace your, 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 your sway bar bushings and your tie rods and your rotors and you got all this front end work that needs to be done. Will we despise that mechanic? We say, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you insinuate that there's something wrong with my car? Right. Right. You know, but a lot of times in life when somebody else comes to us and says, hey, what you're doing is wrong. You need to fix this. We'll despise that person. Huh. Instead of just saying, hey, you know what? You're right. I'm sorry. Let me fix that. What they end up doing is they end up despising that person. And that's not right. We should not despise those that bring uh, our faults to our own attention. We should actually be grateful that there's people like that. You know, the, one of the worst things in life, I heard this recently, is that you, one of the worst things in life is for you to surround yourself with a bunch of people who are just going to tell you yes all the time. Just a bunch of yes men. Get, around, get them around you. They're never going to tell you you're wrong. They're never going to tell you to fix anything. They're just going to encourage you to continue to do all the wrong things. That, that will destroy you. That will bring you down in life. We need people to straighten us out. Because, again, we're all going to be wrong. From one, uh, from, at one point or another in our lives, no one's going to live their life and, and never make a mistake. We all understand that. But when we read the Word of God, when the preaching comes, when authority in our life comes to us and says, you need to fix this, let's not be sure that we get mad at them. Rather, what we should do is just embrace that and say, thank you. And we shouldn't try to avoid those type of, uh, uh, of sources of correction in our life by just surrounding ourselves with people that are never going to correct us. You know, we're going to get out of church because when I go to church, the preacher tells me I'm wrong. I'm going to quit reading my Bible because when I read the Bible, it points out things in my life and I get convicted. So I'm just going to stop doing that. Instead, I'm just going to hang around the same old worldly friends. I'm going to continue to go to the same places I always go where everybody thinks everything I'm doing is fine and no one's ever going to tell me I'm wrong. We should never uh, get to the point in our life where that's our attitude. And we should always be willing to embrace those things, those sources of correction in our life. <laughs> I'll read to you from Psalm 141. It says in verse 4, Incline not mine heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. And let me not eat of their dainties. Let the righteous smite me, and it shall be a kindness. Let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head. He's saying there, you know, it's better, rather than to practice wicked works with uh, them that work in equity and to not eat of their dainties, you know, sitting around and just having a good time, eating all the nice things and just enjoying life with wicked people that are never going to tell you you're wrong. 
Rather than that, he goes on in verse 5 and says, let the righteous smite me. It would be better to have some source of righteousness come along in your life and smack you upside the head and say, hey, you need to fix this, than to sit around and spend the rest of your life with a bunch of wicked people just enjoying life. Because those things are not going to help you be a better Christian or a better whatever it is you are. Parent, church member, employee, uh, child, whatever role it is you are in life. You need the righteous to come and smite you whether it be from the Bible, whether it be from a preaching, whether it be some other source of authority in your life, and to help you. What, what does it say about it? It says, it shall be a kindness. The Bible says the wounds of uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Amen. You know, th that's a good thing to have in your life. You know, some, some of us, we grow, we've grown up without much of a father figure in our life. And oftentimes, it's the father figure that has to bring down the hammer and correct uh, the children, you know, when, especially when things are getting way out of hand. You know, and those of us that have grown up in that situation... You know, we would probably all be able to uh, be able to admit that we're still dealing with the repercussions of, of mistakes that we have made that a father might have corrected, that a, 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 an authority in our life might have occurred and caused us to not make those mistakes. The Bible says it shall be a kindness. Let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil. I mean, is that the attitude we have when somebody comes and corrects us, when the righteous smites us, when somebody says, you're wrong, you need to fix this? We say, that's an excellent oil. Are we grateful for it? Do we embrace it? It shall not break my head. You know, they're not out. It's the, the person who's correcting is not out to just break you down and destroy you. Rather, they're trying to do the opposite. They're trying to build you up. They're trying to encourage you. They're trying to set you in the right way and get you to do the right thing. They're trying to get you to fix that which is wrong. Because <clears throat> here's the thing. It's better to have people who will correct you than, than to surround yourself with people who will encourage you to continue doing the wrong thing. It's better to be around people that are going to correct you than to surround yourself with people who are just going to continue to encourage you in the wrong thing. <clears throat> because here's the thing, misery loves company. And when people are doing the wrong thing, they love them. They get as many other people as they can to come alongside them and do the wrong thing with them. Because then it starts to feel like the right thing. Right. The Bible says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude uh, to do evil. You know, and that's what they do. Multitudes get together and they say, well, we're all doing it, so it must be the right thing. Right. And they feel good about it, but that doesn't mean it's right. Yeah. And we should not surround ourselves with yes men. <clears throat> so, you know, you should admit you're wrong because you're going to be wrong. We all are. And everyone knows it. And a lot of times everyone knows we're wrong. And we can't fix that which is broken until we admit that we're wrong. So we see why we should admit that we're wrong. But what about the point of the sermon? How to admit you're wrong. And now we see why we should admit we're wrong. Now let's look at how to actually do that. Well, the first thing to do is to accept correction, not resist it. Because if we're going to uh, admit that we're wrong, obviously it's gonna, someone's going to have to come to us and correct us and say, hey, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's at that point we have a decision to make. I'm either going to accept that or I'm going to reject it. I'm either going to uh, agree with this person and say, yes, I'm wrong, or I'm going to say, no, they're wrong. Uh, so we need to, if we're going to uh, fix that which is wrong, we need to be willing to uh, accept the correction that comes. And here's the thing. People who refuse correction, they suffer the consequences. You know, their heads are not anointed with oil. You know, it's, it's, uh, they don't receive that kindness. They reject it. And you can find these people in the world. You know, go down to, uh, you know, the on-off uh, the on -off ramps here on these highways and see the people holding signs, the young men, uh, perfectly able-bodied men, you know, standing there in their dirty clothes with signs begging. Those are people who have refu refused correction right. or maybe never received it. And that's the consequences of rejecting correction. When you say, you know, or, or go, go down to the county jail and, and go talk to the inmates there. And ask them why they're there. Because nobody ever told them they're wrong. Or if they did, they said, no, I'm right. I'm going to continue to do what I want to do. You're the one that's wrong. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, we all know this, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. I think that's a verse that you know I find myself quoting myself often or recalling to memory often. And uh, it's one we probably hear preached from time to time. It's probably one, if you've been in church for a little while, you've heard. If you've read the uh, book of Proverbs, you've recognized it. It's one that kind of stands out. 
But I think a lot of us, we hear so much that it be, we become dull of hearing to this. And we start to take it for granted. And we don't understand the seriousness of what this verse is saying. That if we don't accept correction, if we're constantly being reproved, especially if it's for the same thing over and over and over again. You know, we could, take, we could talk about so many different things. I mean, think about drinking. Just, just being an alcoholic. Just saying, hey... You know, uh, you go to the doctor, you got a stomach ache. Well, you've actually got cirrhosis of the liver. You need to stop drinking or you're going to die. You're being corrected. That person's being corrected. And say, nah, you're wrong. And they'll drink themselves to death. They will be suddenly destroyed. <clears throat> we drive down the road, the highways. You know, don't drink and drive. Don't drink and drive. Don't drink and drive. People say, nah, that sign's wrong. Then they get the blue lights behind them. Then they get the DUI. Then they get the, you know, the ten thousand dollar fine. Right. I mean, I've I've met people in my past that have just their life is just a mess because they didn't want to take a, a heed to that that correction of don't drink and drive. You know, it seems pretty sensible, but we have to put up the signs. We have to have the people pulling other people over and issuing tickets and taking them to jail, and putting them in the courts because. Uh, if you do not accept the correction when it comes, you will suffer the consequences. You know, we could think about that as individuals, and if we look in the Bible, the Old Testament uh, 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 nation of Israel, I mean, they embody that perfectly. Of a people being told, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, just over and over and over again. And they don't do the right thing, and they go and do the wrong thing, and what do they do? They suffer the consequences. And those consequences were severe for them. I mean, have we read our Old Testament? The things that happened to the nation of Israel when they got away from God. I mean, God told them, if you get away from me and you stop, start worshiping these false idols, you're going to eat your own children. Right. That's what he warned them. Yep. And people read that when it happens and they go, oh, that's so graphic. How could God let that happen? Well, God warned them about it. Yeah, that's right. They had the word of God. They knew better, right. but they refused the correction. And where did they find themselves? Yep. Go read it. It's in there. Right. They were eating their own children. Right. It's terrible. I can't imagine what would bring a person to such a place. I mean, starvation is a terrible way to die. But that's what happens even in our own lives. We refuse correction, and terrible things can happen in our life that will affect us for the rest of our life. Why? Because we just refuse correction. Say, no, I'm right, you're wrong. <clears throat> the Bible says in Proverbs 21, a wicked man hardeneth his face. It's the same type of you know, uh, imagery there of a man hardening his neck, you know, putting his chin in there. No, you're the one that's wrong. Resisting, not bowing the head, not admitting we're wrong. They harden their face, they get the scowl. <clears throat> but it goes on and says, but as for the upright, he directed his way. You know, if you're not going to harden your neck and not harden your face, you'll, you'll be able to be directed the way you should go. Why? Because now you're receiving it. Now you have a tender heart. Now you have you're somebody that can be taught. So, you know, if we're going to admit that we're wrong, we have to be willing to accept the correction. And people who take correction uh, in their lives, what ends up happening is they end up bettering their lives. They live better lives for it. You know, and I'm not saying I've arrived, and I'm not saying I'm all that in a bag of chips, okay? But I'm a long way from where I started. Yeah. <laughs> and why? Because when I started out, there was a lot of correction. I got taken aside and you know told time and time again, you need to fix this. You need to stop this. You need to stop this. And you know it was obvious to everyone that was going. I remember one time I went to church and I said, and it was before service, and I was just kind of hanging out. The pastor walked in, he just looked at me. And I said, Hey pastor, how are you doing? He just looked at me and said, Well, at least I'm not backslidden. And walked away. <laughs> it was that obvious. I mean, it was just my life just exuded it. And I just thought, and that that just cut me down. You know, that was correction. And I could have just said, nuts to this guy. Who does he think he is? Right. Insinuating on backslid. But I was. You know? But what if I had gotten an attitude and just stormed out of there and said, well, he's never going to talk to me like that again. What, you know, who is he in my life? Well, he's an authority. Right. And he's my pastor. So, you know, uh, people who accept correction, they better their lives. They, you know, the people that are correcting them, they, they're doing it out of love. They're not doing it because they're just trying to make their life miserable. Right. They're trying to make their lives better. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart. Tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. 
When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. I know I've, I've been quoting this verse more often than not from this pulpit lately, but it's the truth. And it's something we have to get across, is that reproofs of instruction are the way of life. We want to live a good life. We want to live a life that we can have peace and joy and happiness. You're going to have to accept correction because we all do wrong. We all make mistakes. And if we have somebody in our life that's willing to come to us and say, hey, you're wrong. You need to fix this. You need to accept that correction. And that's how you're going to live a better life. <clears throat> the Bible says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy word. You know, you should be grateful for those that are willing to correct you. You know, I know I, know I am. You know, I've still got people in my life that, that, that hasn't happened in a while. Thankfully, but not to say I, it couldn't happen. But I have people in my life, friends. I have a pastor. You know, I have a wife. <laughs> that could come to me and say, hey, you know, you're kind of messing up here. You need to fix this. And you know why they would do that? You know why they would be willing to come to me and correct me? It's because I'm not a know-it-all. Because they know if they tell me I'm wrong, I'm going to get it right. The Bible says, speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. People who have understanding and people who, who know when another person needs to get something right, they'll look at that person and they'll say, should I even bother? Should I even bother telling this person what they're doing wrong or what it is they need to fix? Because some people, quite frankly, will not receive it. They'll harden their neck. They'll, they'll harden their face. And they'll refuse it. So the person who has the wisdom will just say, well, I know what type of person that is. They refuse correction. And they won't waste their time. They won't waste their breath. So be thankful for somebody that's coming to you and correcting you because that means that you're the type of person that can be corrected. And they think that about you. They think, well, this person's worth my time coming to them and saying, you need to fix this. And it shows that they care about you and that they want you to get things right. So we need to be willing uh, to admit our wrong or how we're going to admit our wrong. we were wrong. We're going to be able to admit we're wrong by accepting correction. You know, that's the first step in it. And, you know, by not despising those that come and correct us. You know, if we're teachable, people are going to come teach us things. And you can apply that in so many areas of life. I mean, especially in the, in the, in the area, you know, for us men that go out and work or, you know, any of us that are in a field trying to learn a trade or anything like that. You know, I know when I started out prior to this, this position here full time at the church, you know, I was a locksmith. You know, I moved out to Phoenix six years ago. I wasn't a locksmith when I got here. You know, I was, I was a, a laborer in an excavation company. That's what I spent most of my time doing. Very hard work, very strenuous work. And I got here, and I realized that your guys' dirt out here is not really dirt. You know, <laughs> in Michigan, we have this thing called sand, which is very nice to dig in. You can just all day, you know, real easy. You guys got some hard dirt. I mean, I, went to a, I remember I went to a job uh, digging footers. The guy handed me a pickaxe. I said, are we mining for gold here or what? No. <laughs> he said, no, we're, we're digging footers. We're going this far. I said, you need a pickaxe for that? Said, yeah. <clears throat> he had an electric jackhammer. I'm like, good night. <laughs> like, I, I did that for about two days before I got heat stroke. I said, yeah, I think we'll go find a warehouse position somewhere. Out of the heat, you know. <clears throat> but the point I'm trying to make is, you know, I didn't start out as a locksman. And when I started out, I started out as an apprentice, not making very much money. And I had to sit there and let somebody else teach me how to do that skill, how to learn that training. And what if I had, you know, just gotten an attitude? What if I hadn't been teachable? You think they would have kept me around and said, oh yeah, well let's pay him to sit there and, and just be a know-it-all and make mistakes and, and never be able to accept correction? They would have gotten rid of me. So if you're teachable, people are going to teach you things. And it means that you have, you know, intelligence. It means that they care about you. It means that, that you're somebody that can excel in that field if if you're willing to accept the correction. So that's one thing, uh, one way that we can learn how to admit we're wrong is by accepting correction when it comes. But another thing we're going to have to learn if we're going to be willing to admit that we're wrong is to be humble. It's going to take a big dose of humility. You know, some more than others, I suppose, depending on where we're at, where we're starting out. If you would turn over 1 Samuel chapter 15, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Because this really is the source of the whole problem. People who cannot admit they're wrong, it's because they're proud. It's because they don't have any humility. Proud people can't admit 
to wrongdoing. They don't want to admit to wrongdoing. Because think about it, when you admit that you're wrong, you know, that doesn't always cast you in the best light. That always doesn't make you look like the, the star employee. When the boss comes and says, did you do this? Are you to blame for this? No, uh, you know. The humble person will say, yeah, that was me. You know, I'll never, when I was working in excavation back in, uh, when I first started out in Michigan, I was working for Pop Excavating. I remember Ron Pop, the owner, took me to his office one day. I hadn't even done anything yet. I hadn't even broken anything. That was to come later, right? He, but he took me aside and said, look, if you ever break anything, if you ever back into anything, if you ever run anything over on a job site, if you ever clip a tree branch that you shouldn't have, or if you do something wrong, just come tell me so I can fix it. That's all he wanted. Not so I can bite your head off and make you feel like dirt. You know, you're already in the dirt enough to feel like that. But he was just saying, I just want to know. And so many, I mean, this goes such a long way with employers. You know, just being able to say, hey boss, I messed up. You know, let me, instead of trying to cover it up, you know, and make sure nobody knows about it, and then they get found out anyway, you look 10 times worse. It's better just to come to them and say, hey, you know what, I backed right into that fire hydrant. And I've seen people do that. That wasn't me, by the way. <laughs> see people run fire hydrants right over, run into telephone poles, tear down, cut down trees that weren't supposed to get cut. You know, big mistakes. But the boss, at the end of the day, he just wants to know about it. So that, that takes humility, doesn't it? To be able to go to somebody and say, hey, I need to tell you this, but I messed up and I made a mistake. And really, this is one of the major distinctions between the, uh, Saul and David, the first and second kings of Israel. You know, <clears throat> Saul, if David, we won't turn there for sake of time, but if you recall David, when he was called out on his sin with Bathsheba, if we know the story, you know, that when, when, at when times when he was to be out at war, when kings go to war, he re remained back in Jerusalem, and he saw Bathsheba, you know, out bathing herself and said, you know, go fetch me this woman. It was another man's wife. And he ended up committing adultery with her, and even to the point where he had uh, Uriah the Hittite, her husband, killed in battle. Right. And God calls him out on it. And says, you committed, you, you killed Uriah the Hittite. He says, you did it. You know, even though he wasn't the one that physically took the sword and killed him or shot the arrow through him, you know, the Bible says God laid the blame at his feet because he was the one that engineered the circumstances. It was premeditated murder right. and adultery. I mean, and what it, what was but what was his response? This is what made this is the major difference between uh, Saul and David. He said this, I have sinned against the Lord. When Nathan the prophet came to him and stuck his finger out on him and said, Thou art the man. He didn't say, oh no, you don't understand. Uh, it wasn't me. Or try to weasel their way out of it. He just admitted it. And that's where he stopped. It was, I have sinned against the Lord, period. And he just admitted the wrong. Right. You know, that probably took some humility. Or, you know, probably it's because David started out as a very humble person. And remained humble. You know, and knew who he was dealing with. But ultimately it was God. But Saul, here in 1 Samuel 15, he has a completely different, well, not completely different, but he has a different reaction when he's corrected for his sin, which was nowhere near as serious it, it, when you, in human terms, really, when we think about it, as, as what David had done. I mean, Saul didn't commit murder, and you know, premeditated murder and adultery here. But we'll read what he did. It says in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to, uh, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken the fat of rams. Now the story again is, is that he was told to go slay the Amalekites and all that pertained to them. He was to kill every person of the Amalekites because of how wicked they were. Right. And not to even to kill all of their cattle and livestock, to leave nothing alive. And of course Samuel comes and he, he says, What meaneth that he had, had, you know, have you obeyed the voice of the Lord? He comes out, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. You know, and, and, I, and I've done you know, what he, he told me to do. And so, what does Samuel say? What meaneth then the bleeding of the, uh, of the sheep in my ears? He said, you didn't do what you're told to do. You've, you've, you've saved these cattle alive. He saved the king alive, too. Right. And, uh, you know, he gets called out for it. <clears throat> and, of course, he had these excuses. So that's the backdrop of the story. And Samuel here is rebuking him, and he says in verse 23, For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also hath rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. Now that's the same thing that David said. I have sinned. But it didn't, he didn't stop there. There's no period there. He, the sentence goes on. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And thy words. Why? 
Now he's going to give us an excuse. He didn't just admit wrong, but now he's like, yeah, it's true, I sinned, but let me tell you why. And he says, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You know, this isn't really admitting that you're the one responsible. This isn't really him admitting that he's the one to blame. He's trying to say, it's just like Adam and Eve in the beginning. Uh, Hast thou eaten the tree of the, uh, the knowledge of good and evil? The woman that thou gavest me, uh, she gave me to eat, and, and, and I did eat. You know, yeah, I, I ate, but really it's her fault. All right. And that's exactly what we see Samuel doing here. All right. Yeah, I sinned against the Lord. I transgressed against the Lord and against thy word because I feared the people. And this isn't really, this is a half admission. Right. Yeah, you can say, yeah, he's admitting to being the wrongdoing, but he's also trying to blame other people. And it goes on in verse 25. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. So he admits the wrongdoing without really accepting the blame. <laughs> You know, what we can learn from this is that the person who's doing the correction, the person who's coming to you in your life and saying, hey, you need to fix this, whatever it might be, they don't want to hear excuses. They don't want to hear vague answers. They don't want to hear you blaming other people. They don't want to hear a bunch of, you know, him and hawing. They want, to, they want you to just admit that you're wrong. They want to know that you, you have owned up to the fact that you're the one to blame because then they can fix it. Because it all goes back to being able to willing to, to admit you're wrong in the first place. And if you can't get a person to accept the blame for what they've done, you can't help them to fix it. They want you to hear, they want to hear you own your error. That's what when people are correcting you, that's what they want. When you're being called out for something, they want you to say, hey, yeah, I'm right, you're right. I, it's my fault. They want you to be like David, I have sinned. And just stop right there. Not go on, well, you know, I did do that, but. Right. There was these extenuating circumstances, and so and so, and you know, normally I wouldn't have, and just whatever it is, we just start to ramble on. You can just, people, they get called out, they'll just start making up things. <clears throat> and what we see is that it takes pride, or excuse me, it takes humility, it takes not being proud to admit that you're wrong. Because proud people, they can't admit to wrongdoing. Because proud people would rather blame others for their mistakes. They would say, oh, it's so-and-so's fault. You know, <clears throat> and really, that just comes down to the fact that it's human nature to try and save face. You ever wonder why people just start lying when they're getting called out on something? You know, <clears throat> I'm trying not to be too much of an open book, but there was a time where I made a pretty big mistake on the job. And I already knew that I was totally to blame for it. And it, it cost some people some money, some time, some man hours. And my boss called me. And, and he already knew the whole story because there was another guy there with me and saw exactly what I did. And I cut a big corner and I thought, well, no one will notice this. They don't even, they don't even need this. You know, this, will, this won't affect anything. I know this isn't how I'm supposed to do it, but it won't matter. It mattered because I had a call about 9 o'clock that night. And another guy had to go and fix my mistake. And it was for a big client. And my boss called me and said, hey, what happened over there? He already knew everything. And, you know, and I'm trying to be the star employee, I'm trying to be the lead guy, I'm trying to be the, you know, the, 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 his go-to guy. So I'm saying, and I just immediately just start lying, just start making up excuses. And he already knows the truth. And he just asked me, is that really what happened? And you know what, and I can still remember just going, just going, no. <laughs> and telling him the whole truth. The next day he called me in the office, he said, I'm really glad you told me the truth, because I was this close to firing you. That would have been really devastating. He said, don't ever lie to me again. Just tell me the truth when you right. make a mistake. Right. Just to own up to it. And so many times, you know, that's a big tip for those of us that are out in the workforce. If your boss comes and corrects you, even, you know what, and this is one thing I learned, even if it's not my fault, even if the boss just thinks it's my fault, and a lot of times I'll just take the blame anyway. Because then he goes, oh, well, that guy, that's a guy that can be corrected. That's a guy who owns up to his mistakes. I've done that. My boss has said, hey, this happened. Do you know anything about this? Is this you? Did you do this? Or he's, actually, he's coming and saying, you did this. This is your fault. This is why things are this way. He's already convinced in his mind that it's my fault. And I know in the back of my mind, no, it's not really my fault. It's actually so-and-so's fault. But then I could stand there and argue with him and carry on and go back and forth with him. Or I could just say, yeah, you know what? It's my fault. And I've done that. And, and I excelled at that job. <clears throat> didn't happen all the time. I think if you make a habit of that, you know, 
the boss is always coming to you, you know, and having to get this work these type of things out, then you know it's, there's probably a bigger issue at hand. But you know, when there's a time and place when you're being corrected, that's the time to tell the truth, All right? Because you never know what the consequences are going to be. You might think you're going to get away with it, and the next day you don't have a job. The next day, you know, your life's a wreck. <clears throat> So proud people, they can't admit to doing wrong because it takes humility. And they like to blame others because it's human nature to try and save face. It's human nature trying to res retain our respect that other people have for us. It's human nature to try to avoid humiliation. Sometimes it can be really humiliating to say, yeah, I'm wrong, or to own up to a mistake. It can, they will say, you did that? They'll say, yeah, that was me. Wow. You know, it's embarrassing. It's humiliating. But it's still the right thing to do, to own up to it. <clears throat> I mean, that's what uh, Saul did here. If you look there in verse 30, he's trying to save face. This is why he had such a hard time just accepting the blame. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee. He still wanted to keep his reputation. Yeah, I sinned, I messed up. But it was really their fault. Now honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. And turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. So this is what we see proud people doing. Try not, you know, if they do uh, fess up or own up to it, it, it's halfway. It's still somebody else's fault. You know, that's what we see with Adam and Eve. You know, I already mentioned that. How he, we say, oh, it was the woman's fault. And then we go to the woman, oh, it was the serpent's fault. Yeah, I did it, but it was their fault. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we see that admitting you're wrong requires humility. And proud people have a hard time admitting when they're wrong. Because proud people can admit that they're responsible for their mistakes. <clears throat> so let me just conclude by saying this. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. Okay? Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek, okay? Of course, we don't want to be wrong. Being wrong is wrong. You know, we should not make a habit of being wrong in our life. If we're wrong, that's not a good thing. What I mean by that when I say there's nothing wrong with being wrong is that it's okay to admit that you're wrong when you're wrong. If you're wrong, admit it. There's nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing wrong with being wrong. It's perfectly natural to be wrong. You know, I've covered that in the beginning of the sermon. We're all going to be wrong. We're all going to mis get, make mistakes. We're all going to say something that was incorrect. We're all going to say something that was not true. We're all going to uh, mess up somewhere. and Somebody's going to have to come to us and correct us. And we're going to have to be willing to just admit that we're wrong. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the right thing to do. See, people don't want to admit they're, they're wrong because then they have to admit they're wrong and, and they have a real big problem with that. Because they think that, you know, if you're wrong about something, then that's the end of it. You know, then everyone's just going to think this or that about you right. and they're just trying to save their face and save their reputation. And really the reputation they develop is a person who can't be corrected. When you correct somebody and they say, well, I don't believe it, you know, or they say, no, that wasn't me, and they make some excuse, they won't admit it, you know, the person correcting doesn't walk away saying, well, he's just a bright, shining star. They walk away saying, that guy can't be corrected. That person cannot uh, receive correction. So there's nothing wrong with being wrong. The real error in life is when we don't admit our mistakes. That's the real wrong. When you're wrong and someone corrects you and you don't admit it, that's the real error. That's where we make mistakes. You know, <clears throat> admitting our mistakes or admitting our sins allows us to accept correction. I mean, that's really the thrust of this sermon, being willing to admit your mistakes so that you can be corrected. And accepting a correction and applying instruction helps us to fix the problem, right? We admit we're wrong and we accept the correction, <clears throat> then we can fix the problem. And what's the result after that? After we accept the correction, we fix the problem, our lives are better. Our lives are better when we accept the correction. I want to just talk to you about a guy named Niles Henrik David Bohr. Who knows who that is? I didn't know either <laughs> until I looked him up. I found a quote of his I really liked. And then I looked up who the quote was and I thought, this guy, this is a good one. So Niles Henrik David Bohr, he was a Danish guy. He lived back from 1885 to 1962. He was a Danish physicist who made foundational contributions to understanding atomic structure and quantum theory, for which he received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1922. 
Now, the Nobel Prize in physics, that's not something everybody has sitting on their fireplace mantle. You know, you got to be a pretty sharp cookie to get something like that. Right? you got to know your stuff, especially in the area of physics, right? <clears throat> Bohr developed the Bohr model of the atom. So this is a one smart dude. Although the Bohr model has been supplanted by other models, its underlying principles remain valid. So he's like one of the, he, he laid like the foundations for understanding like, I guess you call it, you know, molecular structure, the atom, right? Bohr, you know, that's not all this guy did, by the way. Bohr founded the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the University of Copenhagen. Now, uh, now known as the Niles Bohr Institute, which uh, was opened in 1920, he predicted the existence of a new zychronium-like element, which was named hafnium. Hafnium. I probably I can't even pronounce these words, let alone <laughs> understand what they do in, in physics. After the Latin name for Copenhagen, which where it was discovered later, later that element was named after him. Does anyone know what the name is? Want to take a guess? Borium. Come on, guys. Mm. Are you with me tonight or this morning? There's coffee over there. There's donuts. So he was part of the British mission to the Manhattan Project, which was the people that developed the nuclear bomb. After the war, Bohr called for international cooperation in nuclear energy. He was involved uh, in the establishment of CERN and the research establishment of Danish Atomic Energy Com uh, Commission and became the first chairman of the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Th Physics in 1957. So very credited man, very intelligent man, very smart man, responsible for you know uh, a lot of uh, deep understanding in the world of physics. You know, helped develop the bomb, you know, the nuclear bomb and nuclear energy and things like that. Well, let me ask you something. Do you think and you know, the guy has an element named after him, right? You know, there's only so many of those to go around. <clears throat> Do you think this guy never made a mistake? Do you think when he was doing all that experimenting and trying to discover these things and understanding these things, do you ever think maybe he went down a, a path of thinking, well, this must be, must be this way, and then got to the end of it and found out he was completely wrong? He said because he made a huge mistake in his thinking and his life and had to go back and just start, you know, back to the drawing board, and wipe it all down and start over. I guarantee you that guy had to make mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. In fact, I know he did because this is what he said. He said an expert is a man who has made all the mistakes which can be made in a very narrow field. You know what made him an expert? Is he made every mistake there was that could be made. He knew, understood all the wrong things to do. And when he understood all the wrong things, when he understood all the mistakes that can be made, that's when he discovered the right way to go. That's when he discovered the correct thing. You know, and I thought that was a really good quote. And I thought that's something, you know, we could apply to our lives. And we could say, you know what? It's okay to make mistakes because when we make mistakes and we make the corrections, that's how we get on the path of understanding. That's how we start going the right way. Amen. So let's not despise reproof. Let's not despise correction. Let's embrace it you know, as an anointing oil and let it lead us in the right way so that we can live a better life for it. Let's go ahead and pray.